Hello everyone, my name is Roger. Welcome to my movie journal. Uh, today I'm going to make some brief comments on the recent King of Lorber uh, pre-Christmas Winter Wonderland sale. I purchased six titles, three of which I've never seen before. First up is Yellow Sky, and this is a film directed by William Wellman, who is a very prolific Hollywood director of the time, made several westerns, probably the most uh, famous is the Oxbow incident from earlier, he made earlier in the 1940s, stars Gregory Peck and Baxter. Richard Woodmark Peck, of course, was a big star, 1948, Woodmark was, I think this is his fourth film, and he would soon be a lead actor in many films of the 1950s. The plot is said to come from The Tempest. Uh, it certainly sounds kind of like it. Uh, Shakespeare uh, story line of, in this film, it's about a young woman, her grandfather, they are living in a ghost town and they're mining for gold. And the town is invaded by uh, bank robbers on the lamb being chased by a uh, posse. Um, the film, it, it was filmed in Death Valley, and uh, they built a, a ghost town from scratch in Death Valley. The cinematographer was Joe McDonald. And I recently rewatched John Ford's My Darling Clementine, uh, which uh, a movie that Joe McDonald uh, photographed, and I was just stunned by the starkness of his black and white imagery and nighttime silhouettes, just an absolutely beautiful film. And um, so I'm looking forward to this, uh, the, the North Side, called North Side 777 and Panic, I think that's the title one, Panic in the Streets are two subsequent movies that McDonald uh, photographed that had a similar black and white style. There's no booklet here and the only extra is an audio commentary by William Wellman Jr. Next up, 1952, The Holly and the Ivy. It's a Christmas-themed movie. I always liked this movie. I haven't seen it in quite a while. It's directed by George Moore O'Farrell, who is uh, basically he had lots of TV credits, but he made like four or five movies right in a row in between all these TV credits. This is probably his most famous movie. It's adopted uh, from a play by Winyard Brown, and the screenplay by Anatole de Grunewald, and he was a Russian emigre, and he um, uh, is said to have given this film a kind of Chekhov texture. So we have Shakespeare, <laughs> now we have Chekhov. Uh, and it's, and it, it sounds kind of Chekhovian, uh, it's family problems, uh, it's a little bit long lingering that surface at a Christmas family gathering uh, with a father who Plays a, who is a cler clergyman who is uh, uh, very adept at preaching the love of God, but rather inept at showing love, that same sort of love to his own children. Incredible cast, young, very young, Denholm, Elliot, Celia Johnson from Brief Encounter, uh, terrific actress Margaret Layton, who played uh, the same role on stage, and uh, Ralph Richardson playing the father, and he, he had a very fine performance. Uh, there's no extras on here, no booklet, but there is an audio commentary by historian Jeremy Arnold. Apologize for that little shake. <laughs> Next up is we go to Italy, 1960, and we call Adua Eli Campagna, more commonly known as Agua and her friends. According to IMDb, it was called Hungry for Love, <laughs> which is a kind of a title that in, a, in the United States you would give to a foreign film hoping that you know, it would attract attention. Uh, director Antonio Pe Petrangeli, who I had never seen any of his movies until a few months ago, and uh, he has become rapidly becoming one of my favorite directors. Uh, a Criterion Channel has I, I Knew Her Well, which is well worth seeing. And 
the um, and amazingly enough, I I, I uh, searched on his name on Amazon Prime, and five movies came up free for Amazon Prime members. All of them worth seeing. I think they're all terrific. But I, I guess if you want an introduction to Petra and Jelly, uh, the visit with Sandra Milo would be would be my top recommendation. This is a story about. Uh, a time in Italy when uh, prostitution was made legal, the brothels were closed, Adjo and her friends opened a uh, legit business, a restaurant, but they were pressured to go back into prostitution and use the res restaurant as a cover. Another great cast, Simone Senior A, Sandra Milo from The Visit, Manuel Wevak from Hiroshima Mon Amour. A small role, I gather it's a small role, I've never seen this film, and uh, another shake, apologize again, uh, this is a low-tech video in <laughs> production, uh, Marcello Mastriani appears um, uh, on the credits at the end, so I, I'm presuming it's not going to be a, he's, he's not, it doesn't have a big role in this film, but of course he, Mastriani's always worth seeing. Uh, there is a, this is a slipcase, and this is the actual Blu-ray package, and it, it uh, does. This one does come with a with a uh, booklet, and uh, including an essay, a biography of Peter and Jelly, who died tragically at the age of forty-nine. Um, he, uh, I think, while he was making his last film. Um, this also has some contemporary reviews. There's no commentary though in this this. Uh, Next up is 1968's Isadora, and this stars Vanessa Ridley. It was directed by Carol Rice, who is a very interesting director, I think. Uh, uh, I like a, a lot of his films. Morgan, Who'll Stop the Rain, The French Lieutenant's Woman, several others. And um, the Isadora Duncan was a famous dancer, really part of the 20th century. Uh, she was... She was uh, kind of notorious, scandalous affairs. Um, as a sideline tidbit, the um, Isadora's best friend uh, was uh, Preston Sturgis's mother. And Preston Sturgis, as a young boy, traveled throughout Europe with Isadora and his mother. Uh, I don't think Preston Sturgis' character is in the movie, but I believe his mother uh, uh, is, is portrayed in the movie. Uh, and of course, that's Vanessa Redgrave. She won the Best Actress at the Cannes Film Festival. She was nominated for Best Actress at uh, the Academy Awards. Uh, she didn't win. James Fox, Jason Robarts also star in the movie. There's a controversy over the running time. The original running time was 177 minutes, so almost three hours. And the um, it got bad reviews. It was thought to be way too long, uh, so they they did a couple of different cuts to, uh, into the running time. Strangely enough, according to Wikipedia, the original 177 minutes version, the original version, was shown on NBC TV and was also the version that was put on VHS tape. Um, but this is the 140 minute. So you might wonder why most film buffs would probably want to see the 177-minute version. Tina Warber took some heat, and they, they said, well, the 140-minute version was what the studio restored, and they didn't think the title was would be popular enough to be able to finance two restorations. But still, you would think the 177-minute one would be would be the far more uh, popular one. There's a there's no booklet with this. There is an audio commentary by filmmaker Alan R. Cush and historian Daniel Kremer. And I, I'll take a little memoir alert story here in that in 1968 I was a uh, the movie critic for my college newspaper. This was in Brockport, New York, and uh, the. Uh, which is about 35, 45 minutes west of Rochester, where I lived. Rochester had many movie theaters. Brockport only had one, so I always made an effort to 
uh, see what was coming next to the uh, to the local theater and see if I could see it in Rochester. And, uh, and this Isadora was the first movie that I ever reviewed that was public uh, you know, that was published. Uh, strangely enough, the second one was another uh, movie that was panned uh, both commercially uh, and, and critically, and that was uh, Finian's Rainbow, uh, which was uh, Francis Ford Coppola's, uh, I think it was his last film before he made The Godfather. Next up, The Good of France, 1984, and this is Sunday, a Sunday in the country. The director was Bertrand Travenier. Uh, he won the Best Director at Cannes, Film Festival that year, Best Foreign Language Film at the New York Film Critics and the National Society of Film Critics. I've never seen this film. I, uh, Coup de Torchon is on the Criterion, uh, is in the Criterion uh, collection. Uh, I've also seen a film of his in the same period as this film called The Judge and the Assassin. I saw that no, it was released very briefly in New York City, and I, I can never remember having a chance to ever see it again. I don't think it's ever been on physical release, so it's one of my uh, very high on my wish, wish list. This film obviously has a very much a genre noir feel, look to it, maybe a picnic in the grass or a day in the country. Um, no booklet, but an audio commentary by Tavernier himself, and that should be very interesting, Tavernier being a film critic, and I think he's made a history of cinema type uh, documentary, uh, and I've seen him interviewed many times, and he's a very interesting uh, conversationalist. Last, we go to Hungary 1985. This is Colonel Redl, and this is a film by Istvan Szabó. Uh, Colonel Redl was another historical figure from roughly the same time period as Isidora Duncan. Pre-World War I, um, he was uh, involved in an infamous spy scandal. I don't know much about the history of it, but it was very famous in its time. The movie um, was nominated for Best Foreign Film at the Academy Awards, did not win. The star is Klaus Maria Brandauer, one of the great actors of the 20th century. He made some English language films out of Africa he was the villain in the James Bond movie, Never Say Never Again. And it's part of a kind of a loose Zabo Brandauer trilogy that included the more famous Mephisto. The other one is Hanus and Mephisto is also available on King of Lor Lorber. Um, and uh, Zabo, and both Zabo and Brandauer are very old now. And Zabo hadn't made a film since 2012 when I looked up on IMDb and, and uh, February of 2020 in Hungary, uh, they reunited on a collaboration in a movie called Final Report. There are minimal extras in this, but it does include a, a booklet, a very thin booklet with uh, a couple of essays in it, and one, one is by Zabo himself. Lest you think that I'm only interested in, uh, in overlooked, obscure movies of the past, uh, yesterday, a package arrived with the Jason Bourne Ultimate Collection, five films. Uh, the Bourne movies, especially the first two, I think are probably uh, my favorite action films of the new millennium. And of course, as you can see at the top, it has a 4K UHD. And it's only my second purchase, uh, the 4K UHD purchase for my recently upgraded uh, TV and 4K Blu-ray player. My first was uh, my pride and joy, Alfred Hitchcock classic collection. It's almost worth buying a 4K UHD TV and a Blu-ray player just to see these four movies <laughs> in that format, Rear Window, Vertigo, Psycho, The Birds. They look absolutely magnificent in 4K UHD. So if you have any comments on the King of Lorba sale, what you bought, what I bought, Jason Bourne comments. Any comments you would be welcome. Otherwise, that's a wrap. And until we meet again.